Apple II Wire by Wire, Video Memory Interface. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. In the previous two videos, we built a simple raster generator. This circuit produces the horizontal count, the horizontal sync, and the horizontal blank signals. Similarly, this circuit generated the vertical count, the vertical sync, and the vertical blank signals. We used this circuit to combine the vertical and the horizontal signals. And then we generated a composite output using this circuit. And success! The raster generator was able to generate the sync signals and display a white box for the active area. But as you're now discovering, looking at this box gets pretty boring pretty quickly. We want to display information the microprocessor has generated. Now the Apple II stores this information in its main memory. Here's the way the memory is laid out in the Apple II. There are two text pages, which are also used for low-res graphics. And there are two high-res graphics pages. Now, I know for a fact that Pac-Man uses high-res page 1. This means the image of the maze with Pac-Man and the ghosts is stored in main memory, starting at location 2000 hex, and it goes up to 3 FFF in hex, which is an 8 kilobyte block of memory. The image in high-res text mode is basically stored as a bitmap. The image is 280 pixels wide, and it's stored as 7 pixels per byte, so each line consists of 40 bytes of information. For a row of pixels, these are just stored in contiguous memory locations. However, figuring out where a line of pixels are stored in memory is a lot more complicated. For example, when we just sequentially step through the memory erasing it, we get a dissolve pattern that looks like this. This section might get a little confusing, so if you don't follow it straight away, don't worry, you may need to watch it a couple of times. It took me a few goes to get the draft of these slides right, so I'll be impressed if you understand it straight away. But stick at it. It's actually a very clever mapping generated by Steve Wozniak, and it's designed to fit the display area available, and arrange the sweep pattern through memory to keep dynamic memory refreshed. This image is from inside the Apple IIe by Gary Little, and in high resolution graphics mode, this is the mapping from line number to memory address. RLN stands for relative line number. And it's essentially the bottom three bits of the line number. And these have been transposed 10 places to the left. And the reason for this is so that we can use the same sweep with characters and still keep the dynamic memory refreshed. In fact, in text mode, relative line number isn't used to address the memory. This image might make it a little bit more clear. VA, VB, and VC form the relative line number, and these go to video address bits 10 through 12. And although this nomenclature isn't used commonly, I'll call a group of eight scan lines a character row. He's making it up as he goes along! Not so, there are 24 character rows, each with eight scan lines. Character row 0 maps to 2000 hex, while character row 1 maps to 2080. Character row 2 maps to 2100, and character row 3 maps to 2180. So for at least the first 8 character rows, we can just see that it's counting up by 80 per character row. Character rows 8 through 15 basically have the same pattern, they've just got hex 28 added to them. Similarly, character rows 16 through 23 have the same pattern, but this time they have hex 50 added to them. So if we do the math, it means signal V0, V1, and V2, mapped to video address bits 7 through 9. And that's because we're adding 80 hex per character row. So the signal mapping from raster generated to memory address so far has been pretty straightforward. And now we get down to the last bit where it does get a bit tricky. The memory block that was wanted to use was an even power of 2, exactly 8192 bytes. But the active display is 40 by 24 characters, and neither of which are a clear power of 2. We can divide the 24 by 8, which is a power of 2, and this leaves us with three regions, which are character rows 0 through 7, character rows 8 through 15, and 16 through 23. And conveniently, 40 characters times 3 is 120 bytes. So Woz packed this 120 bytes into a 128 byte block, using address lines A0 through A6. Both 120 and 128 are divisible by 8, so we can just take the first three bits of the column number and map them directly to A0, A1 and A2, 
More specifically, signal HC0, HC1, and HC2 directly map to the main memory A0, A1, and A2. So this just leaves us with these four bits, A3 through A6, that we have to figure out. If we go back to our mapping, we see for the first 64 scan lines, which I've called character O037, we actually just want to add zero to the base address. For scan lines 64 through 127, which I've called character rows 8 through 15, we want to add 28 in hex. 28 hex is 40 in decimal, and this represents the 40 characters in a row. And for scan lines 128 through 191, which I've called character rows 16 through 23, we want to add 50 in hex. And 50 hex is 80 in decimal. Here's another way to visualize it that might make more sense. And again, now we can achieve this with a 4-bit adder. The 74HC283 is a 4-bit adder. It has two inputs, A and B, and produces a sum output, which is A plus B. If we feed HC3, HC4, and HC5 into A, and the staggered pattern of V3 and V4 into B, using this wiring for the B input of the adder, when V4 and V3 are zero, we don't add anything to the base address. When only V3 is high, we add 28 hex to the base address. When only V4 is high, we add 50 to the base address. And when V3 and V4 are both high, we actually add 78 to the base address, but we don't really care because this occurs during vertical blank. Now you don't need to understand every detail of this mapping at this stage. Let's just wire it up and see if it works. I've added an EEPROM, which contains a still of a Pac-Man screen from 2000 hex to 3FFF. And now I'm adding in the 2A3 adder. Connect up power and ground to both chips. And now I'll connect up wires to all the address pins, and I'll label the first three appropriately. Then I'll connect the next four up to the adder. And I do this so I can add either 0, 28, or 50 hex, depending on where I am in the screen. Now I'll just label the rest of the address pins. Now the A and B inputs to the adder are actually interchangeable. 5 plus 7 is equal to 7 plus 5. And just to be annoying, I chose the opposite wiring for this build. The image starts at 2000 hex, so I'm going to need to hold A13 high and ground A14 through A18. Now we also need to ground the VPP pin, output enable, and chip select. Here's the first part of our circuit. Now I'm going to add it to the breadboard build.
you remember that we stored 7 pixels per byte, which means the EEPROM is now outputting 7 pixels at once. In the Apple II, the 8th bit is used for colour palette selection. I need to serialise these 7 pixels that come out of the EEPROM in parallel. And I can do that with a shift register, and the 74HC165 can do this. When PL is low, the 8 parallel bits presented to the chip are latched internally. Then on the rising edge of clock, the bit pattern is shifted out through Q7 one bit at a time. Now when PL is low, the bit pattern for 96 hex is latched. And now on the rising edge of clock, each bit is outputted starting at bit 7. This shows the correlation of the parallel bits in the input and the serial bits in the output. I'm going to put an octal D-type flip-flop between the output of the EEPROM and the shift register. Now, strictly speaking, I could probably get away without doing this, but knowing exactly when the data is valid should make it easier to debug. Connect the EEPROM to the flip-flops. I'll place the shift register, then invert it so the pins line up. And they can just directly connect them. Now to connect the power signals. The shift registers clocked at our dot clock rate, which is 7.16 MHz. This comes from our clock circuit. And the load signal I'll generate in a moment. I'm going to put an AND gate on the output of the shift register so that we only display during the active regions. Next, I need to label the output of the first clock divider so I can generate the load signal. I want the load to occur when all the outputs from the first 393 are all low. And because the parallel load signal is active low, I can just do this with some OR gates. I need to label the inputs to the OR gates so they match the outputs from the first 393. Let's see if we can get this to work. Right, let's see if it works. No. Okay, we'll make sure we've got the right input selected. Still no. I think I'll end this video here. The bring up might be tricky, so I'll do a whole video on it. So don't forget, like, subscribe, and share.